Okay, great. So I'm very happy to be here and be able to talk to you a little bit. Uh, would be nicer to <laughs> be there in person, but never mind. Um, that's how it is. So, so yeah, um, I guess you've already had some nice lectures from Yuval on, on flavor uh, in the standard model. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat anything he says, I hope. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little view of um, how QCD affects uh, flavor physics. Um, it's going to be kind of my own perspective. So I'm sure it's not at all complete and probably not how other people might have done it, but um, yeah, I'll do it in that way. So my idea, so, so this is lecture one of flavor physics and QCD. Can everyone see the screen well? Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me. And, um, yeah, uh, you could also write in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, I'm, I'm using a tablet, so sometimes I get my mouse gets lost. Like that, yeah. yeah, anyway, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat. And uh, or just if I ignore your messages in the chat, just let me know and uh, interrupt me. Um, Okay, so lecture one of physics and QCD. Um, I have four lectures. So the first one uh, is going to be just an introduction to QCD, which is going to be useful for the rest of the lecture. Um, I'm going to talk a little about flavor symmetries um, with respect to the QCD Lagrangian and um, renormalization group running. So we know how to run the masses and the coupling, which are really important for uh, doing flavor physics calculations. Um, symmetries and RG running. Then I'm going to be talking, giving you a brief introduction to effective field theories. Uh, related to, again, flavor physics calculations. I'm gonna talk about the RG running of the operators. And uh, explain a little bit about how one can do a resummation of logarithms, large logarithms. And in the third lecture, uh, I'll talk about form factors, which form um, an important, which play an important role in, again, in phase physics calculation. I'm going to talk a little bit how one can parameterize them. And because that's what uh, partly what I've been working on in the past. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Lightcon Samuel's calculations for the form factors. Mm. Non factor, but two. Relations. And finally, um, another important element of flavor physics calculations uh, is QCD factorization, which is used in exclusive processes, a way of calculating exclusive B decays, whether it's B to um, B to non-leptonic decay. So ions, kaons, whatever, or whether it's um, a rare, so B to uh, a meson and gamma, or B to a meson and L plus and minus. Okay, great. So, uh, 
So I'm going to start now with the first first lecture. So an introduction to QCP. I'm sure some of you it's going to be extremely basic, but for some people maybe not so much. So I think it's better to start at a at a more basic level. Okay. Um, is it all? Can see it? Yeah. Okay, now I've got the chat open. So. Okay, so um, what is the motivation? So I, I'm also going to ask questions, so I hope that maybe people will will answer. Um, please don't be shy. So what is the motivation for color as a symmetry? Uh, why did people think that there should be an additional quantum number uh, or an additional force? Uh, so one, one reason was that they needed to understand uh, why you could get a baryon with three identical quarks. So you could have this um, omega ion, for example, which is made of three S quarks. Now in order to, these are fermions and a baryon is a fermion. So one needs to be able to construct some sort of anti-symmetric wave function. Um, and in order to do that, uh, you need to have some, it doesn't work with spin, right? Because there'll be two which have the same spin. So you need another quantum number of which there are three possibilities uh, in order to distinguish between these. Okay, so, so that's one of the things that gave people the idea that there might be some additional quantum number labeling quotes. Um, and people had the idea about color. So as I said, you know, construct and this symmetry wave function need a quantum number. Okay, great. So, so now we know there has to be QCD. Uh, so what does the QCD Lagrangian look like? I think you might have already seen this if you've done, but I'll just take a second to write it down. So we of course have the kinetic term of the photons, I mean the gluons. Then, so this A is the S3 index. Then we have a sum over fermion, um, quarks more likely, where F is the flavor index, having a mass MF. And here D, of course, is a covariant derivative with two color indices A and B. And A is the the one. Okay, so we've written down this this Christy Lagrangian very nice. So in a minute we're going to go ahead and renormalize this Lagrangian. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the about the symmetries of this Lagrangian, particularly the asymmetries that the symmetries that arise in the limit where the quark masses um, are very small. Okay, so that's mostly for the up quark and the down quark, and also to some extent for the strange quark. Um, let's just write down now this Lagrangian for 
just the up and the down foot. So, as I said, this thumb that I small, I guess you know that the up and the down foot masses are very small. So we can neglect this. And then we just have a very simple leg origin here. And this simple leg origin uh, is subject to a number of symmetries. So, so what about the conformal symmetry? Does someone know what this conformal symmetry is? What is conformal symmetry? Scaling? Yeah, scale. scaling. Yeah, uh, it's exactly that. that. Thank you. Who is this? Diana. Diana. Hi. Hi. Thanks for answering. So, so yeah, the conformal symmetry is a symmetry um, in rescaling the Lagrangian looks the same. So, um, in the case, of course, where the, where the quark mass is vanished, um, we can make this transformation. So, uh, so we we scale x by lambda, then we scale the qf. Now, can someone tell me also what is the mass dimensions of the quark field? Yeah, and Chica? Yeah, three by two. Three by two, yeah, exactly, thank you. So, so when we do this sort of scale transformation, then we scale it by um, lambda to the minus three by two, because lambda is, is in the, this um, length. And then similarly, I guess you know that the gluon mass the field has mass dimensions one, so we scale this by. A over lambda. Okay, so when we do all these scalings, it turns out that our Lagrangian stays the same. Um, so that's that's nice. However, uh, this symmetry is not preserved finally at the quantum level, and that's because the natural scale emerges of QCD at around two hundred MeV, and that's known as lambda QCD. So I guess most of you already know that. Um, but you should note that. Below the scale uh, and above the masses of the MU and MD, there is some sort of uh, asymmetry observed. So, um, so there's the conformal symmetry. However, it is broken at the quantum level. Okay. Um, now, okay, that was a conformal symmetry. Maybe it's not so relevant for uh, for flavor physics, but what is very relevant for flavor physics are some flavor symmetries which are also seen. Okay, so So the first invariance that we observe is that if you change each individual say, uh, each individual quark flavor by uh, you rotate it by some phase, you see that the Lagrangian is invariant.
And the conserved current looks like this. Okay, um, what other similar uh, rotations could we imagine? Um, can anyone suggest any other transformations we could put um, in, the, in these talks? Okay, well, that's okay. Uh, you can also even rotate the UND quarks amongst themselves because uh, QCD doesn't see the charge of the up and down quark. For, for QCD, the up and down quark look the same up to their mass. And here we are ignoring the masses of the, of the quarks. So you could imagine making an SU2 rotation. Okay. So. You have a question? So you can imagine that uh, you could go to some new flavor F prime or Q field F Q prime by some rotation omega, which changes the flavor F to F prime. And omega is equal to exponential i sum over sigma i alpha i. So alpha i is some charge, sigma i the Pauli matrices. Um, so this omega results in, in rotations in z between the u and d quotes. Uh, and this results in some sort of, I mean, you know what? The Pauli matrices are. This is an SU2 symmetry vector. So this is a U1 vector symmetry. This is an SU2 vector symmetry. Okay. But we could also split these quarks up into left and right handed parts and say that all of these symmetries are uh, valid both for the left handed and the right handed components. Okay, I'm changing the basis. We can say that there's a vector symmetry and there's an actual vector symmetry. Okay, so, um, so now instead of this expression, we have. Uh, we have the same thing, but yeah, uh, separately for the left and right components. Okay. Um, and we have a vector rotation when Alpha lambda equals I equals alpha. Yeah. And it shown if it's the inverse. Okay, so omega is defined just like this, but now we write alpha L and alpha R. Okay, so it seems that the symmetry group is really quite big. We have an SU2 vector, we have an SU2 HL vector, we have a U1 vector, and we have a U1 HL vector. Now, does anyone know what, what happened to this U1 HL vector symmetry? Broken. Yeah, how? 
Oh. Why is it not there actually? The U3 uh, Excel part breaks it to SU3 times U1A where U1A is not broken. I remember this. No, the U1A is actually not there because of it's anomalous. It's not a symmetry of the quantum theory. The quantum. It's not a symmetry of the quantum theory. At the quantum level, it turns out that this symmetry does not exist. Okay? It's not conserved. The current is not conserved at the quantum level. And this SU2A, it turns out, is broken spontaneously. And how is it broken? By It's broken by the quark condensate. Okay, and this breaking, spontaneously breaking, so what happens when a theory is spontaneously broken? We get Boltzmann bosons. Yeah, and is it, what's the mass of normally of the Goldstein boson? Uh, zero. Zero, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so because of this spontaneous breaking, there's uh, Goldstone boson. And does anyone know which, which particle is this Goldstone boson? Yeah. Pions. Yeah, it's the pion. So, um, so we get a Goldstone boson. And why is the mass of the pion not zero? Uh, does anyone know that? Uh, the symmetry is not uh, exact, like the mass. Yeah, symmetry. exactly. Very good. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's all I want to say about symmetries. Does anyone have any questions? No questions. Okay, great. So, so the idea is that actually the symmetries that remain, well, the SU2 in particular, is quite helpful doing the flavor physics. Um, because we can use that there is this approximate symmetry in the in the Lagrangian to um, uh, to guide us into how the results uh, the predictions should be uh, when we change u to u quarks to d quarks and vice versa that they should be more or less similar. Okay, great. So. So now we had a quick look at the, the nature of the Cusub de Lagrangian. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, renormalize it and have a look at the beta function. So to deal with 
divergence is in loop calculation, in loop corrections to Ring's functions. We need to, first of all, regularize to have an explicit parameterization for, of the singularities, and then we normalize to render them finite. Okay. So the reason that I'm going into this, so the reason, uh, yeah, the reason I'm going into this is that in the next lecture, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the operator product expansion and the operators which are which are used in order to calculate B decays, um, and one very important aspect of these calculations is that uh, Wilson coefficients, so the coefficients in front of the operators uh, have to be chosen in the calculation at an appropriate scale. And in order to find the Wilson coefficients at the appropriate scale, we know, need to know how to run these Wilson coefficients from one scale where they're calculated to another scale where they need to be applied in the calculation. So in order to do that in the next lecture, we need to be quite familiar with how uh, the renormalization group evolution works. So I thought I would do uh, an example for the QCD case before the basic QCD case, so the alpha and the running of the masses, before next time we apply it to running of operators and resumming. And, and doing this running is a way of resumming large logs which arise, which I mean also talk about tomorrow. Okay, so that's why we need to do this now. Um, so maybe many of you are familiar with it, but it's always good to see it again. Um, okay, so, so to deal with divergences in loop corrections to Green's functions, we first need to regularize to have an explicit parameterization of singularities and then we need to renormalize them so we need to get rid of these singularities in order to render the greens functions finite So how is regularization generally done? Dimensional regularization. Like yeah, we, what's that? We go to a uh, dimension uh, four minus epsilon and uh, instead of four dimensions and then- Exactly. And, and, and then what, uh, and, why and is then that write, done? Write the divergence in terms of one by epsilon plus- Yeah, and exactly. Very good, very good, thank you. So, So you said epsilon, but not there, what the four minus two epsilon. Then um, the renormalization to remove the divergences. So generally, uh, quite often, not. I've also worked in other schemes, but often we work in the MS or the MS bar scheme, where one just subtracts the, the divergences directly. All the divergences with some two other terms that always arise. Okay, so 
So we know how to recognize, we know how to renormalize, how, do one, how does one actually do that in practice? Uh, so the first step is to um, renormalize the fields and parameters of the Lagrangian. So we replace bare fields and bare masses by some renormalization constants and renormalized fields and renormalized masses. So for example, in the, in the Lagrangian, the bare gluon field will be replaced by this. The bare quark field will be replaced by this. So here, the, the things without the indices are the renormalized versions. The coupling will be replaced by this. So the scale, why, does anyone know why this scale new is introduced here? To make uh, the G dimension this. Yeah. Okay, so just looking at um, the quark kinetic and mass term without anything else, the bare Lagrangian will look something like this. And then when we do these replacements, we get something like this. Okay, so uh, so here we just have exactly the same terms, but without the the bare index zero, and here we have two other terms that look the same, but they have some z minus one um, expression in front of them. So so who can? What are these terms? Someone please tell me what these terms are. Yeah, those are the counter terms. So these are exactly these terms that are going to cancel the divergences when we calculate our loops. So for example, um, so, so these counter terms which go like z minus one can be treated as interaction terms. Contributing to Green's function. Oh. Contributing to Green's functions in perturbation field. So for example, if we have the quark self energy, um, the, well, here we have the quark propagator, then you would have some counter term coming from these terms. And then you calculate this loop then the divergence coming from the this quark self energy diagram will be cancelled exactly by the the counter term and z are chosen such that that, that happens.
Okay, so one can simply calculate all the relevant diagrams. So one has to calculate some self energies of the quark and of the gluon, then you have to calculate some vertex corrections. And you calculate all the diagrams, you, you see what the divergences are, and then you choose all of these z's uh, accordingly in order to cancel the divergences. And then when you calculate any process, uh, if you can include the counter terms, then the final result should be finite um, in the full theory. Okay, great. So, so now we know how to, how to calculate at least one loop diagrams in QCD um, and make sure that the result is finite. Um, now, how can we use this information in order to understand the scale dependence of our parameters? So it's actually pretty simple. It turns out that the scale dependence, so for example, of the coupling, G is given by something called the beta function, which depends on epsilon. So this for epsilon from four minus two epsilon and the coupling itself. And this beta can then be written as minus epsilon G minus G one over Z G D Z G over D then mu. So it turns out that the scale dependence of, so this epsilon g, uh, just comes from, from this part. Um, because we know that, sorry, I should have started by this, but we know that the bare quantities should be independent of scale. Okay, so dg zero by d mu is equal to zero. So then taking, the right hand side, we can straightforwardly obtain this equation, right? Okay, so, so in order to know the scale dependence, okay, we take the limit epsilon goes to zero because after we finish renormalization, we can set epsilon to zero. And then uh, we find that the, the scale dependence is just, can be calculated just from knowing the renormalization constant of the coupling. And I said that we've already calculated it and we know the renormalization constant of the coupling. So, so that's all there is to it. And this is known as beta g. So that's more or less what, what is known as the beta function in QCD. Okay, so that's the running of the, the coupling constant. What about the running of the mass? So we do it in exactly the same way. We say d by d lin mu of m0 is equal to zero. Therefore, we find d by d lin mu of m mu is equal to minus gamma m m mu. So what is this gamma m? Anomalous dimension. Yeah. So what does it tell us? Well, it does tell us actually what, what I just wrote down. It tells us how the, the mass is uh, scale with me. Um, and how do we calculate it? So we calculate it in the exact same way as, as here. It's one over Zm, Dzm by d lin mu. So it's actually the more or less a scale dependence of the log of the uh, renormalization constant for the mass term in the function. Okay. So, so the beta function, And the anomalous dimension.
Yeah. So the beta function, the anomalous dimension gamma n, control the the scale dependence of the PC coupling and the quark mass. Note that, of course, that these can be expanded in perturbation theory. So you can you can write them um, like this. So you can say beta g is equal to minus beta naught g cubed over 16 pi squared minus beta one g to the phi over 16 pi squared squared and gamma m is equal to gamma m zero g squared over 16 pi squared plus gamma m one g to the fourth over 16 pi squared squared. So you have to go up to whatever order is necessary for the accuracy of the calculation we're doing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. So, um, so the point is that if you want to, um, no, okay, sorry. So these, these renormalization group equations, which we have here, this one and this one. So these renormalization group equations for the mass and the, and the, the coupling can be integrated and we can get explicit results at a certain order in perturbation theory for um, the scale, for the coupling at some scale with respect to another scale or for the mass at some scale with respect to another scale. So at the two loop level, um, one obtains some expressions. These can be integrated. So our alpha s is equal to four pi over beta zero in mu squared over lambda squared, one minus beta one over beta naught squared in mu squared over lambda squared over mu squared over lambda squared. And for your mass, it looks something like this. Now, the important point here, for example, for these masses, is that we haven't expanded this term. So you have some ratio of the, the couplings raised to some power. And then we have, um, Then we have some expansion in the in the couplings. Uh, sorry, alpha s u means alpha s and alpha. Okay. So, in order to get a two loop result, we go up to order beta one and gamma m one, but these go up to quite high orders in the coupling. So in order to get a two loop result, we need to run including up to um, the second order in, in these uh, expansions. Um, the other thing I want to say is that what happens to the coupling when mu decreases? What happens to alpha s? In 
Yeah, earth phase increases. And um, at what point does it become non perturbative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this lambda here is this lambda QC that I was speaking to earlier. And when you approach lambda QCD, then you get a very sharp rise in, in this alpha. And this is different from QD. The, the, the sign in the beta function is opposite from the QD case. Um, okay. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, earlier, you mentioned that the uh, scaling symmetry uh, breaks down due to this lambda QCD. Uh, can you explain a bit, like, uh, how is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the point is that um, uh, in order for the scaling symmetry, the, the scale symmetry to work and formal symmetry to work, you need there to be no scale in the Lagrangian. You need the Lagrangian not to know where it's situated in terms of the mass scale. So if the masses of the quarks are zero, um, then in principle, there's no scale in the theory. However, in QCD, a natural scale arises at around this uh, lambda QCD. And the theory, and because it's strong, because the coupling becomes strong, and this changes the theory completely. So QCD is actually always aware of where, of which scale it, it is at because the, the theory changes so much um, at, no, at lambda equals 200 G, uh, I mean. So that's why uh, the conformal symmetry no longer works. Yeah. Is it clear? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, earlier you mentioned that the conformal symmetry means the scaling symmetry, but uh, shouldn't the conformal symmetry also include the uh, special conformal transformation that, like... Uh, the what? The SCTs, the special conformal transformations. I mean, I mean, I did a... I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. I, I did a transformation in X as well, but that's not what you're saying. Uh, no, uh, like we do a uh, inversion, translation, inversion, that kind of thing. Ah, okay, sorry. I'm not really an expert in conformal symmetry, so maybe someone else can answer you better. Okay, sorry, I, I can look up what you're trying to say and I can try and give you an answer tomorrow. Any more questions? Okay, good. So maybe we can also start a little bit on the on the next lecture, I found a little bit faster than I was expecting. Um, I just noticed, <laughs> sorry, I hadn't looked in the chat for me. Um, and Julia was asking about Lambda QCD. Do you, is it clear now? Or do you have more questions? about it. Okay. No, she's disconnected. Okay, so that's fine. Um, okay, so, so now let's talk a little bit about, um, give you a little introduction, brief introduction to EFT before we end.
Okay, so so the basic idea of effective field theory is that, um, well, of course, there's interesting physics at all scales, and um, as you've moved through uh, your physics career, you've started you've started off studying just electromagnetism and classical uh, and well, not even classical mechanics, and then you learned more and more, and you saw that special relativity was existing and um, that electromagnetics was replaced by um, QED um, and that there's general relativity. So, so the idea is that we have moved towards theories which are more and more general. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, if you're working in theories which are more general, in general, calculations get more and more complex. So the idea of effective field theory is to find the simplest framework to capture the essential physics for a given problem in a manner which can then be corrected to arbitrary precision. So as I said, the calculations in these more general theories are more and more complex. Then EFT, effective field theory, is the simplest framework. to capture essential physics for a given problem in manner that can be connected to arbitrary precision. So for one, one example is that, um, well, we're talking about scales in terms of conformity, but in, in QFT in general, there can be many mass scales that enter the calculation. And taking into account all these possible mass scales or all these possible virtual states is a complicated problem. And perturbation theory might break down because if you have multiple scales that um, which are what well, have a clear hierarchy, uh, you end up having large logarithms. Um, and does anyone know why having these large logarithms is a problem? Non perturbative? Yeah, why? It will not converge if the higher order will have more contribution. Sorry? So the perturbative theory will not converse. Uh, yeah. The higher order corrections will be more relevant. We cannot neglect. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the, the idea is that if you have your coupling, which is supposed to suppress higher order terms, if this coupling comes along with some logarithm, which is, um, Along with some logarithm, which is which is large, then this revert this undoes the suppression of the coupling, and so therefore your higher order term is actually at the same or um, numerically similar size to your uh, lower order term. Um, and so one way to deal with this is to find some way in order to sum up all of the largest order terms. So you have some series in alpha n, lin m, and the sum over n m. And this is whatever, some coefficient that comes in front of it. 
So um, in order to get an accurate answer at what we call leading log, then we need to include the sum of this alpha n and lin m for n equals n. We need to include at least all of these terms. But that means that we have to include some parts of two loop, three loop calculations up to infinity. And effective infinity gives us some clever way in order to do this. Um, and then to go to NLL, we have to sum up all of alpha n, ling n minus one, and so on. Okay. Um, I guess I've run out of time, um, but uh, we'll carry on with this tomorrow morning. So any more questions before you finish? Seems not. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, thank you very much, Eva. Thanks. Yes.